lot of these people do it. They make it look so easy. Uh, unfortunately for me as an introvert and a slightly overweight man, I have no interest in interacting with the social world, so I'm distancing myself from the outside. It's fine, however, I still get rations and basic necessities from contacts from the outside world, and as entertainment, I barricade myself with all the video games in the world that I happen to own. While we're on the subject of parkour, since I can't really do simple exercises, uh, the virtual one seems to be the closest thing to the real thing, right? I mean, have you played Metal Gear Solid VR missions? I heard it trained you for the real thing. So hey, why not just put the sucker into the Xbox and see what I think of it, and just for fun, let's give it a rating at the end of the video and decide whether or not this game gets to graduate Video Game Academy, or drop out like Faith in a couple of seconds. Because I am a professor after all, I wouldn't misinform you guys by just taking that title and putting it to my name now, would I? DICE, the developer for the Battlefield series, wanted to branch out and diversify their catalog of games to develop, so in order to change the tone with a new IP, they made Mirror's Edge as it was officially announced at the GDC in February 2008. Now, the game may look like a first-person shooter, but in actuality you do more platforming and free-running than actual shooting. Most first-person shooters at the time were all about the shooty-shooty bang-bang, and the closest thing we have in terms of first-person non-shooters would be Portal, and even then you still technically shoot, just not with bullets. Even graphically, the game experiment with the use of colors, most of the game was very white with some occasional colors sprinkled in to indicate depth, and in November 11, 2009, the game was released on Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and two months afterwards, the PC. That's the brief history of Mirror's Edge's development, but from personal experience, I don't remember too much about this game, but from what I remember, it was one of the first games I picked up for the Xbox 360. I don't think it was the first game though, that honor goes to Red Dead Redemption. From what I remember during my memory, and without embarrassing myself by watching my old content, I think I enjoyed this game, or at the very least, liked what I played when I first got this game, but never actually beaten it until I did a Let's Play for it, so this makes me wonder if I'll have the same mindset when I revisit the game once again. I'll be covering this game on the Xbox 360, and I will cover it on the Xbox One X, as it is backwards compatible with it. So sit back and relax as I tell you the tale of my experience revisiting the game as we dive into Mirror's Edge. Alright, here we go. We start off with a tutorial section where our manager slash father figure named Merc tells us how to properly parkour with the help of this young lady. She is Celeste, Fate's personal runner friend. They tell you what button does what. You run, you climb, you go up and down and all around the city by utilizing those context sensitive actions you're parkouring. You'll utilize both left buttons, the left bumper and left trigger, to jump and crouch respectively. Now, normally a jump button is reserved for the A button or the bottom face button equivalent, but the left bumper isn't a bad substitute at the very least. Depending on where you are, or how fast you run, both buttons would alternate between ascension and descension actions. You use these two buttons for nearly everything, such as left bumper for climbing, wall climbing, wall jumping, and grabbing the zip lines, and for left trigger, sliding and tumble rolling for a safe landing. These two buttons might as well be your progress buttons, since your left hand will be busy utilizing action commands and movements, while your right hand is free for looking around your surroundings, and interestingly enough, optional commands for additional help. The B button marks your next destination, which can really work whenever you're lost or unsure of where to go. The X button is to enable slow motion, making disarming enemies a lot more easier to time, and while we're on the subject, you can use the Y button to disarm if you manage to parry in time. Here, Celeste, why don't you demonstrate this for me? Ah, well it tells me not to shoot her. Oh, you know I'm gonna do it. I mentioned before that the use of color is of utmost importance in the game, and you can tell from the color red whenever it shows up. Whenever you see the color red, it's usually an indicator that it's the pathway to progress. That's something I always found amazing when it comes to game design is when developers integrate graphics into gameplay, and I feel as though I don't need to mention this, but this game is stunningly beautiful. I know I'm playing this game on the Xbox One X, so graphics may have been enhanced, but I remember loving the way the game looked even back when I played on my Xbox 360. These cartoony cutscenes kinda look cheap, but they have a certain paper mache animation that I can appreciate. I do think the character models could look better. It could be age catching up to the game, since I'm sure at the time these characters looked realistic, but man, aside from that, the character designs, I absolutely love it. Each runner has a sort of style that matches perfectly to both parkour and their characteristics. It's like they're stylized with basic product placements, without the product placements. I just have to compliment Faith's look as well. It's a shame that most of the game is at first person because Faith has an iconic look to her. The tattoo eyeliner on her right eye, the tattoo on her right arm, the red gloves, the minimalistic black tank top, and cargo pants. She looks like she knows her stuff. With the tutorial section done, it's off to our first mission. 
Now, as a quick note, I will be spoiling this game, so uh, if you guys are planning on playing this game for the story, then I suggest playing it first, although, to be fair, there's not really much to spoil in this game. The meat of the game is mostly the parkour action, so you'll be breezing through that, because in terms of narrative structures, it's nothing groundbreaking. For instance, the first mission, you toss it back to Celeste, like... What philosophical way can I explain this? How the emotion of the toss is to let go, and to let go means to be free? Nah, it's just a yellow fucking bag. We go and visit our sister Kate, but it turns out she got into some trouble as she's framed for the murder of Robert Pope, a friend of their father who's running for mayor. The only hint we get, though, is a note that says Icarus. Of course! The key to finding the murderer is inside this game! So to find out what Icarus means, we need to find a man by the name of Jackknife, and it's this point where I feel the combat needed some work. Okay, so I've complimented how well running feels when controlling Faith, but there will be some instances where you need to fight. I don't know if some of these sections you could just avoid them and run, in fact I like the parts where you're just too overwhelmed by them to the point where running is the only option. But some of the times there are moments where I feel I need to progress by dealing with all the enemies, whether it's doing some melee damage to them or my preferred method, stealing the gun and firing back. I think the controls feel neutered since aiming and shooting of the gun feels a lot less responsive, and I want to say that that was the point. Even if you choose to ignore the gun and focus solely on CQC, the game is not designed for combat. I can pretty much spam the right trigger until the enemy is down, and in it itself feels way too button mashy for my liking. I feel like a combo system would have worked very well since using your left and right hand for some combo combinations would have been better. It would have felt like a first person beat em up game cause otherwise, these are my least desired aspects of the game. Anyways, we find Jackknife but he's running away so we gotta chase him. And it looks like he's going for a big hefty jump, this could really backfire if one slip up and OH HE IS TASTING THE ASPHALT! We meet up with Jackknife after he literally eats shit. He tells us to look into some dude named Ropeburn who happens to know more about this Icarus and what it has to do with framing Kate. But before we confront Ropeburn, we pay a visit to Lieutenant Miller to tell him about Kate's framing and information on Icarus, something he still needs info on as well. Afterwards, we infiltrate security to confirm that Ropeburn is behind all of this and it turns out Icarus is actually a project plan rather than a person, so we're one step closer to figuring out what Icarus is. We meet up with Lieutenant Miller again to inform him about rope burn, but it turns out his company is actually the reason why the police managed to increase in security, and that a certain runner is in the way to stop the plan. We have none of that and disarm the poor bastard, but respectively return his gun back. Faith manages to find a helicopter that rope burn is in, so we head to his location and SEND HIM UP! One quick time event later, we interrogate him while he's clinging for dear life. Turns out he did frame Kate for the murder, but hired someone else to kill Pope and plans on meeting them at a remote location. <laughs> I'm sure he's fine. Alright, now that that's done, let's head to the next location and, uh, oh. Uh, this, okay, well, despite this door being red, it's out of order. Uh, it's pointing up to this window, so maybe I need to go up there? Okay, so I've complimented the fact that the use of the color red is a good indication on where to go next, but that starts to become a little... Strike that. A lot more confusing if they send you some mixed messages. Sometimes the level design tends to blur from place to place, and where you assume will be progress is actually backtracking. Sometimes there are no red markers to indicate where to go next, and sometimes an entire room is red, so trying to find your way out would be a pain in the keister. Doubly so if the B button decides it doesn't want to work, or straight up tells you the wrong location on where to go. This doesn't happen often, I mostly see this around the mid to the end game point, but when it happens, it's a complete gamble for the player to figure out where to head next. So for this area specifically, I don't want to go to this window where I assume, since the door is red and the air is pointing upward, but rather up here where the environment is blocking the door. One long trek out of here and we escape to god knows wherever the hell we are and to safe ground. This game is starting to feel more like a puzzle than a platformer. My goodness, I only told you the important story bits, but the way of getting there took forever! This has got to be my least favorite chapter in the game, it just goes way too long and the payoff is just too... Boring. Later chapters wouldn't even let you figure out how to progress with a B button sometimes and at best they would tell you where to go to advance to the next checkpoint, but not exactly where to go unless you repeatedly press the B button. And other times you literally have to figure out by yourself what happened. Listen to that sound effect, that's me matching as much as possible and still nothing. Was I supposed to go upwards in that general location? Then why is it that I had to go into this door to burst the story? Why?
Well, we do get more backstory on Faith and what she had to go through in her life, her mother killing a protest and her father suffering from the loss of his wife, and Faith running away from home. This should have been foretold beforehand. I found it weird that this conversation is being held with just Celeste in a nighttime rooftop. This should have been mentioned, like, during the introduction or some flashback when Faith and Merc are having a conversation while Celeste is in the sidelines learning about this. It sort of feels like they were trying to advance Faith and Celeste's relationship when it's already implied that they are friends, like, what? You think she'd know Faith by now? So this window is indestructible. I don't know how to segue to the next chapter, but man, these guards are just turn- OH CRAP! Well, we managed to find the database on what Project Icarus is all about, and it turns out it's data pertaining to training soldiers to chase after runners and deal with them. While searching for more cameras, Faith notices a familiar face. It's him. Him? The guy I saw at the mall. I've just seen him on a camera. What? Are you serious? Those are boobs. That's clearly a woman. Like, wh what the hell are you talking about, Faith? Wait a minute. No. They can't be that obvious, can they? No, no, no that, that can't be right. Like, that's, a, that's obviously a female model, but Faith and Merc are using male pronouns for some reason. It's just... No. No, that would just completely ruin the twist. Well, we follow the big-breasted man into a shipping containment and confront him with some more CQC. Wait, what? What is that kick animation? That looks like my drunk uncle trying to learn kung fu. And also, listening to the voice clips, I'm pretty sure that's a woman behind the mask. <laughs> Can you guys not hear them yourselves? So we chase after him and take off his helmet and surprise, it's a woman, but not just any woman. Cell? Okay, so Celeste being the bad guy all along, I don't mind it too much, I just feel it was way too obvious since she's the only female runner in the game aside from Faith. So it either had to be her or a completely random female bad guy we never heard until now. I think the fact that her name was Celeste was a pretty interesting foreshadow by itself, but when you add in some extra story elements, it just gives us more and more hints that she's obviously the bad guy. You start to make the player feel like an idiot. Jesus EA, you don't need to patronize us, damn. Actually, you know what would have been a more interesting twist? If Kate was the bad guy behind the mask all along, the thing about it, despite being sisters, her and Kate are polar opposites. Fate's a criminal, and Kate's a police officer. I think it would've been a more interesting turn if we framed someone else for Pope's murder to get Kate off scot-free, only to find out that Kate actually did murder Pope after all. It could be due to major disagreements, political power. That would've been a more effective way to see this person you know and love turn out to become the person you despise, but instead, Kate is just a damsel in distress. A basic way to get the main character a purpose to advance the plot, how level there is. So all while that charade is going, Kate has been found guilty, so we have to save her from jail time. We got a sniper rifle, don't ask how it's conveniently placed there, and shoot the engine off and rescue Kate. We tell her to meet up with Merc as he plans on protecting her. He didn't protect her. God damn it, Merc, you got one job! Kate got kidnapped and was abducted to a place called the Shard, so we had to go after her for one final mission. But on our way there, we get caught by Miller. Good work. Check her. Oh damn, the man finally lost his mind. Actually, it turns out they did find the murderer after all. Roper! Oh, wait, I, I thought it was Celeste that did the killing. I, I guess hiring a hitman would make him liable, but... Ugh. Anyways, the cops are slow, and they just happen to find the last-minute evidence after the trial? That certainly was convenient. No time to explain more. Okay, that makes sense. So we get onto the rooftops, and it turns out it was Jackknife that kidnapped Kate. Do we really need this many plot twists? The story's already basic enough as it is. Doing this won't make it any better. But that isn't even the main twist, because there's a bigger person behind everything that happened throughout our adventure. Let's just say I know who the bigger fish are. Callahan. Who the f*** is Callahan? No, seriously, this person is never mentioned in the story. He or she just got name dropped by the end of this game. I is this a sequel bait? I sure hope so, because this game would be a complete letdown if that's not the case. Hmm? What's that? This game's a prequel? Well, I guess this Callahan better show some significance when I cover it. You can't live on the edge all your life, Faith! Sooner or later, you have to jump! 
Okay, I guess that'll do. And so we jump onto the helicopter, Jackknife gets killed in the process, escape the helicopter crash, and finally reunite with our sister. So after rescuing my sister after that slog of a mess and complaining about how this bland story turned into an incoherent mess, uh, I'd probably say that this game doesn't really have all that replay value at all. And then I would tell myself, boy, are you wrong, buddy? The level design just takes some time to get used to, and to be fair, for any first-time player, you'll be bound to be stuck in some locations, especially if the game purposefully hinders you. But I feel this game was designed in a way for you to speedrun this game, since after going through some time trials, I had way more fun going through it. Yeah, the rope burn chapter is still crap, but I believe this game is best played on a second playthrough, because by then you already know how to beat the level and improve your time. It also helps that the way you control the game is so user friendly, as when you make a mistake, that's on you and you continue to practice until you nail the game. Just watching the game in action looks jaw-droppingly amazing, and when you get to perform these tricks and shortcuts yourself, there's no better feeling in the world. If you want an even more in-depth spectacle and replayability, just look at the speedrun community. These guys are amazing at showcasing the inner works of the game and making multiple categories to differentiate between this horde eyesore and how a normal run would look like if there were less glitches involved. So let's finish this review by giving this game a grade. Uh, despite all its shortcomings, I still believe that this is a good game to play. Once you get past the confusing level design and the bad combat controls, this game has a lot of replay value and an exhilarating ride from beginning to end once you master the parkour segments and because of that, it is my deepest honor that this bitch gets graduated. That was a bad idea. <laughs> something about myself today. Uh, I've learned that, you know, kind of lazeling yourself around in this dank of a cave, you know, it's just not healthy. I, I gotta like start going outside more often, you know, get that adrenaline rush and actually start exercising so that my big tappy wappy is no longer gonna be this big. So you know what? I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that and you're gonna see a brand new me after this. Hold on, be right back. Okay, so parkour in video games is nothing like parkour in real life. Uh, for one, there's physical labor, so moving your entire body is not really the equivalent of moving the left stick on your left hand. Uh, speaking of my left hand, I managed to break it while parkouring, so uh, there's also physical pain involved. And on top of that, there's apparently a pandemic going around, and no one has informed me about this, and I managed to get the virus, so I got about 19 episodes to live. 